Okay, we're going to do a study today on what about interracial marriage? Uh, there's been a lot of controversy on this whole thing recently um, because of the liar Brian, Brian Moonan that came out and uh, linked me and Eric Phelps and Peter Ruckman together as racist railers. Uh, interesting that he would use a modern politically correct term, a kind of a mind control term. Uh, they say the, the name racist, uh, meaning somebody who hates other people, uh, considers themselves the superior master race, and neither I nor Eric Phelps nor Peter Ruckman consider themselves the master race. Uh, all of us are supporters of the nation of Israel as God's chosen people, and all three of us stand for separation, segregation, okay, not integration. And that's really what this whole thing is about, interracial marriage. It's about integration. It's about destroying what God originally designed. And I'm going to show you the scriptures today. Okay, I know that there's a lot of emotion going around about this issue. And why? Because there has been a concerted effort by the Vatican. The Vatican is the one that writes the textbooks. They, they're behind the thing. Okay, read your Bible. Uh, Mystery Babylon, Revelation 17 and 18. Uh, they're the ones that are behind everything. Okay, that's who God's wrath comes upon in that time of Jacob's trouble. I'm not a... Uh, some kind of a wild-eyed, paranoid, whatever. I'm not. I understand what the Bible says. My Bible says it's a false religion headquartered in a city that has seven hills, the Vatican City. The collars are purple and scarlet, Rome. And all these Catholic, closet Catholics that come out and say that Mystery Babylon is America. Um, America's not a city. America's collars are not red or scarlet and purple. All right. It's, it's the Vatican. And the Vatican is the one who is behind this whole thing, this integrationist policy. That's why you have, I did my video, Angela Merkel going over meeting with the Pope, and all of a sudden it's like, hey, let's bring millions of Arabs into Germany, flood them into Germany, and all, a lot of the other European un Union countries are being flooded with Arabs right now. It's part of a uh, Catholic crusade to bring the, you know, the Catholics, they bring war to the peoples, to the Arabs' nations, and then they drive them out of their nations into white nations, uh, nations of Japheth. They're sending them out of their boundaries and things into other countries. And that's, that's facts. Okay, we're not even talking about quote-unquote racism type of stuff here. We're dealing with facts. This is what's going on right now in our world. And then Time Magazine comes out and gives Angela Merkel a award, Person of the Year. And meanwhile, the Pope is saying that the Muslims are our brothers and sisters who worship the same God. Well, they actually do. They worship a false god. They don't worship the god of the Bible, though. But you see, let me just, I want to set a couple of ground rules here for this study. All right. Number one, I'm not doing this study because it's controversial and I love controversy and I love to stir up division or something like this. That's not why I'm doing this. I've had requests for this study now for years. And I've just, I've had other things to do. It's been on my to-do list, but... Uh, you know, I've had other things to do. Uh, this isn't just a recent thing that, you now, in other words. Um, this is a very clear teaching from Scripture, the thing of interracial marriage. A lot of people are saying it's very ambiguous. What about Noah? Or, or not Noah? What about uh, Moses? What about this? What about, you know, Timothy? What about... We're going to look at those things. We're going to look at those today in this study. It's going to be very detailed. It's going to be two parts, I'm sure. Maybe more. I don't know. There's a lot of Scriptures. Three pages of notes. I've been doing this uh, study now for years, um, doing the research on this whole thing, seeing what the Bible actually says, and um, there's going to be a lot of facts in this. And uh, you know, another thing I want people to understand about me is that um, I'm not interested in pleasing men. And if I wanted to please men, I would go along with the whole um, entertainment type of a thing and whatever. Uh, and I would not say things that could offend people and go against our modern politically correct system. Uh, I'm not going to do that. Um, we're going to look at the scriptures. And I know a lot of you are not going to be able to uh, endure sound doctrine. So you're already writing your comments against me and calling me a bigot and whatever else. Um, you know, again, a lot of those comments are just going to be deleted. I don't have time for it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm seeing... Uh, the end of the ministry at some point in time. I don't know when. Uh, I'm going to keep fighting, but uh, 
The point is, it's going to be God's people that put an end to this thing. Uh, that it, because they can't endorse sound doctrine anymore. And, you know, there are always going to be that remnant out there that's, that's uh, you know, able to see things from Scripture. But more and more, it's just like, you know, I look at Paul, and again, you know, I did my thing there, should we follow men or God? And uh, when you see Paul, he's writing and he's, you know, you see his ministry starts out, everybody loves him. And then it's like, am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? You know, and, and this people... You know, they're coming after him and that person's going after him and stuff. You see this time and time again. He, his leadership within the body of Christ is being continually undermined and undermined and undermined. Bringing out stuff against him, lying about him. You know, he's calling people ministers of Satan because why? They're destroying what he's coming to do. Uh, he goes to the Corinthians. He's preaching to the Corinthians. Time you read 2 Corinthians, he's going through and he's going, why are you believing this? Why are you believing these things against me? He's being backstabbed. And you see Paul starts out, he's buddy with a lot of people. By the end of his ministry, he's naming six guys that he's with. And then, only Luke is with me. He talks about being in bonds and a lot of people are ashamed of him because of it. That's going to be the natural way my ministry is going to end. I'm not going to compromise. Just as simple as that. You know, when donations start to go down and things like that, it's not, you know, oh, you're too lazy, you're not going to get a job or whatever. Uh, if it comes back to it, I will gleefully get a job. If the Lord says, just go back to your secular, the secular world again, make a living that way, okay, I'm doing it. It's just as simple as that. But I will never compromise the truth. If this King James Bible says something clearly, I'm going to preach it. And I don't care who I offend. And you know, another thing I want to say, just kind of a rebuke, a loving rebuke to my brothers and sisters in Christ. One of the reasons I use a lot of sharp language and a lot of, uh, you know, hateful speech and things and sarcasm and stuff like that is because God put me into this ministry. And I know what kind of false prophets are out there. And that's why I'll use sharp statements and sarcasm against them because I'm trying to warn you. And yet I see a lot of you, you'll go and you'll listen to people that I rebuke. And I say to myself, I wonder why that is. I see that. A lot of you, oh brother, I love you, but you know, what about this argument? What about that argument? And I'm going, I know where you got that from. You got it from Brian Moonan's video, calling me a racist railer. Brian Moonan that uh, openly uh, works for television stations. As a professing Christian, wife works for the Department of Defense. But that's okay. And he can lie about things. And I'm going to be going over some scriptures today that he wouldn't dare cover in his study. And we're going to be looking at the stuff that he brought up too, by the way, calling me a racist and Eric Phelps and Peter Ruckman. I'm going to be showing you the scriptures that he won't dare cover. Those are controversial places in scripture that uh, he just kind of gloss over that. Kind of funny too because he called me a hyper-dispensationalist not even understanding what that means and yet I'm called that I only read certain parts of the scripture and ignore others and yet that's exactly what he's doing. These non-dispensational people have a history of ignoring huge portions of scripture. I don't ignore any part of scripture. I rightly divide. And I'm going to show you today that there are scriptures that happened before the law and those things have never been done away. God never said in the New Testament, hey, I want you to stop this and I want you to stop that. It's all binding on us today. We're going to look at this. So, having given that as a little bit of an introduction, here we go. And I'm not going to apologize for anything that I'm going to say from here on out. Um, I'm going to be preaching from the Word of God. Again, I was going to use a bunch of illustrations and things and to show what interracial marriage does and how it does it. I'm not using any illustrations. I'm not going to give any kind of cute little things or animation or whatever else. Nope, nope. Sorry. If you want to do that, go listen to one of the false prophets that uses that. Again, you know, years and years and years and years of research, study, preaching, 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 and some little jerk comes out and puts out a little video with a bunch of fancy graphics and people just go, uh, and they leave all the doctrine all the strong meat of the word and they go off and they listen to the false prophet because he has pretty graphics. 
you got some problems if you're doing that. Now let's get into the scriptures. Okay. What about the word marriage or marrying? Well, there's a good place to get started on this whole thing. And believe you me, this is a this is going to be a good study. If you like the word, if excuse me, if you love the word, if you love good strong meat, this is a good one for you. I realize most people are not going to make it through both parts. They're just going to quit with the first part because it's, it's too much to listen to. Okay, run along, go play, you know, go, go out in the yard and play with your toys, okay? This is going to be a strong sermon with lots of strong doctrine. And the Lord showed me a lot of things in this, uh, answered some questions that I've had. This, again, the research for this thing, three days, right in these notes. So let's start out. Matthew chapter 24, verses 36 through 39. It says here, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, New Testament word for Noah, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Hmm. Jesus is giving a prophecy saying, hey, what was going on back there in Noah's day? It's going to be the same way before I come. What was going on back then? Let's continue reading. Verse 38, For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. Noah enter, entered into the ark there. Well, of course, eating and drinking, people do that at any time. But what about the thing of marrying and giving in marriage? Was there something unique about the marriages that were going on back in Noah's day? Well, why don't we turn there and see? Genesis chapter 6. Lots and lots of scripture to go through today. If you're not looking this stuff up in your King James Bible, then shame on you. You need to make sure that I'm not lying to you. Don't just sit there and look at the pretty scriptures that come up on the screen of the entertainers out there. Get your King James Bible out and read it. And I realize some of you, you know, you'll put this on some kind of a portable MP3 player type of a deal and you'll be listening to it while you're working or whatever else. But uh, this is the kind of thing that you really need to be looking and following along in your scripture so you can see it, you know. Genesis chapter 6, verse 1. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair. And they took them wives of all which they chose. Okay, stop there for a minute. Now, I've talked about this in other studies, and again, controversial here, according to some people, but uh, the sons of God in the Old Testament are always, 100% of the time, the time, they are references to angels. Read the book of Job. The sons of God never once are men, regular men. These are angels. Read it. Job chapter 1. All right, it's right there. All right, we're not going to go there. But, you know, the point is you can do this study on your own. Listen to my study on uh, what are angels. All right, I talk about it in great detail there. And it's actually in the fifth kingdom again. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. So it comes back. Strange marriages. And you say, no, I don't believe that. It's just men. Okay, let's keep reading. I'm going to show you that that doesn't work. Verse 3, and the, and the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. Do you ever wonder where the stories of Hercules and some of these other guys, the Minotaur and things like this, you ever wonder where that mythology came from? Stories of what was going on back there. And by the, by the way, it also continued after the flood. And I believe it's continuing today as well. Some places. And it's going to really accelerate in the future. But you see this thing there. You say, well, I just believe it's just regular men. The sons of Seth. The sons of God is the sons of Seth. Then why are they able to do something that other regular people can't do? Having giants. No, if you compare Scripture with Scripture in your King James Bible, I don't know about the new ones that come from the Vatican. I don't know what they say. They probably change things purposefully, which they do. 
But uh, the King James Bible teaches that the sons of God are angels in the Old Testament. Well, I just don't know if I can believe that. Why? Are you ashamed of the book? Well, I can tell you, if you're ashamed about that, you're going to be ashamed of a lot more by the end of this study. I'm a Bible-believing Christian in all matters in faith, of faith and practice. We'll see about that. We'll see if you want to stick by God's Word and what it teaches, or if you want to abandon it and go with the modern, politically correct, Jesuitical system. We'll see. You know, as time gets, it goes on, and the great falling away gets worse and worse and worse, and more and more people fall away, more and more people go post-trib, more and more people say, easy believism, no repentance, no changed life associated with salvation. As more and more people fall for it, it's going to separate, as they say, the men from the boys. And there's a lot of saved sisters out there that have more guts than a lot of men I've seen. So separating the men from the boys is not excluding my saved sisters in Christ. A lot of you have more strength and more conviction and are not afraid of what people think of you than a lot of the men, you know, the men I see on this channel. Verse 5. What did God think about all this? And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Well, Jesus said, as it was there in the days of Noah, it's going to be the same before he comes back. So right away, when you see all this integration that's happened, and well, this is just the way it is, and I got four or five different kindreds in my ancestry, and I've this and that, what do you think God thinks of it? Jesus said it's going to be the same back there as it is going to be before he comes back. Was Jesus wrong? Verse 8, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. He had messed around with strange flesh. And Noah walked with God. More on that later. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. We're going to see about this later. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. I can assure you, when people start to blend, it leads to violence. Things go wrong up here. Oh, well, I disagree. Listen to the whole study and then make up your mind. All right? I know some of you are so convinced you've gone into this study with preconceived notions, you just know the Bible teaches what you believe. But you better just look at the Scriptures first. Don't judge the matter before you hear it. You know, there's great reward that comes to those who stand by the Word of God, no matter what people think. And you've got to keep that in mind. But let's... Look at what happened to mankind after the flood. Right? Now, do we see any kind of differences with kindreds or tongues or nations before the flood? No. No, we don't. So what was the strange flesh thing back then? Angels. The sons of God coming in under the daughters of men. There's messing things up there. And again, you know, there's a lot of other points that I'm going to have to leave out here for sake of time because this thing could very well be, you know, six, seven hours long, but I'm going to have to leave some things out. I mean, you can go back to the thing of why was the flesh being messed with and stuff. Well, you go back to Genesis chapter uh, 3, where it talks about, you know, Satan beguiling Eve and things. And, and the Lord says to him, I'm going to, you know, a seed of this woman is going to bruise your head. And so the devil's been trying to mess up that seed. And he's still trying to mess it up too, by the way, because God has a purpose for a certain particular holy seed which we're going to see later on. The Bible actually says those words too, by the way. Genesis chapter 9, verse 18 through 29. And the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Ham is the father of Canaan. 
These are the three sons of Noah, and of them was the whole earth overspread. And Noah began to be an husbandman, and he planted a vineyard, and he drank of the wine, and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. And Ham the father of Canaan saw the nakedness of his father, and told his two brethren without. And Shem and, Ham, or Shem, excuse me, Shem and Japheth took a garment, and laid it upon their shoulders, and went backward, and covered the nakedness of their father, and their faces were backward, that they saw not the, their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his wine, and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. And Noah lived after the flood three hundred and fifty years, and all the days of Noah were nine hundred and fifty years, and he died. Okay, he gives three distinct prophecies for the three basic kindreds of people. All right, very interesting. Uh, now let's look at Genesis chapter 10, verses 1 through 5. Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and unto them were sons born after the flood. The sons of Japheth, Gomer, and Magog, and Madai, and Javan, and Tubal, and Meshach, and Tiras. And the sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, and Ripthath, and Togor, Togarma. And the sons of Javan, Elisha, Elisha and Tarshish, Kittim, and Dodanim. And the, but by these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, every one after his tongue, after the families, after their families in their nations. Okay? So the isles of the Gentiles, the northern European uh, region there. Now let's look at verse 6, Genesis 10, verse 6. And the sons of Ham, Cush, and Mizraim, and Phut, and Canaan. And again, I'm not going to go through all of these scriptures. You can watch my study on, does the Bible teach racism? You know, and of course it doesn't. It teaches kindreds, different kindreds and things. Tongues, peoples, nations. So I covered that in more detail. I'm not going to cover it again. But you see there, now we're talking about Ham. All right? Uh, let's look at verse 8 through 10. And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erek, and Akkad, and Kelni, in the land of Shinar. So Babylon starts with a descendant of Ham, Nimrod. The Roman Catholic system uses Latin as their official language. Why? Because it's North African. The three languages that appear on the sign above Jesus Christ, Hebrew, Greek, Latin. Shem, Japheth, Ham. That's the way it works. You say, well, that's your opinion. No, it's what the King James Bible teaches. Well, I don't agree with it. Okay, then you're not in line here. This has nothing to do with my interpretation, you see. But look at uh, verse 15. Jump down to verse 15 there in Genesis chapter 10. This is going to be important later. And Canaan begat Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth. H-E-T-H. -H. Remember that. Heth. That's going to be important later. You're going to see why. Go down to verse 19 and 20. And the border of the Canaanites was from Sidon, as thou comest to Gerar, unto Geza, as thou goest unto Sodom and Gomorrah, and Adma and Zeboam, even unto Lasha. These are the sons of Ham after their families, after their tongues, in their countries, and in their nations. You see how God separates, puts them into their different nations? We're going to see about this. I'm going to prove it to you in the study. But you see there again, three things. Babylon comes from the descendants of Ham. Heth, which you'll understand the significance later on. And number three, you have Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah was descendants of Ham. And let me say this, I don't believe that the, the three sons looked that much different, obviously. But as time progressed, and they're marrying and intermarrying and intermarrying and intermarrying, the particular characteristics developed. You say, well, why would that have happened? Because that's the way God wanted it to happen. God created things that way so that there would be a broad range of differences between the people. Unique characteristics. Diversity. True diversity. And again, I've talked about this in other studies. Jesuitical diversity. See, they rewrite 
the English language, these Satanists that are from the Vatican. And they'll call diversity everybody coming together and putting aside your differences so that we can all be blended into one. That's not diversity. Diversity is saying, I'm different than you and I'm going to stay separate from you. Segregation. And it's not because I'm better than you. I don't believe that I'm better than any other kindred out there. No, I'm different. Okay? You know, it's kind of like when you played with Play-Doh when you were young or whatever. Maybe some of you still do. I don't know. Uh, but uh, when you play with Play-Doh, you have red, blue, and blue, and yellow. And what do you do? You keep them separate. Why? You put them together, they get all swirled together. You can't get them apart again. And you put enough of them together, different colors and things, pretty soon you got this gray blob there. You've lost a, lost a distinction. It's still Play-Doh, though. <laughs> yeah, but it's lost its distinction. It's lost its unique characteristics. And that's what Satan wants for the coming New World Order, the coming global citizen. He wants a blended, integrated person, sexless. All religions the same. We all think alike. That's what he wants. That's not what God wants. And again, I'm going to prove it in this study. Genesis chapter 10, verse 19. Oh, excuse me, we just read that. Genesis chapter 10, verse 21. And unto Shem also, the father of all the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth the elder, even to him were children born. Okay? Again, pause it. You can read all these verses if you want to. We're just not going to for sake of time because there's a lot to go over in this study. Get a little thing here quick. Um, so I don't lose my place again. Okay, we have, next jump down to verse 30. Through 32, speaking of Shem's descendants, and their dwelling was from Mesha as thou goest unto Sephar, a mount of the east. These are, are the sons of Shem after their families, after their tongues in their lands, after their nations. These are the families of the sons of Noah after their generations in their nations. And by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. Before the flood, all the nations, all the kindreds, all the tongues, there's just one. After the flood, something happened. Now God's plan is division. He says, okay, you go that way, you go this way, you go that way, and stay separate. And man in his sin says, no, we're going to join together. You see, something that you have to understand is there's a lot of places in this King James Bible where man's sin, man's mistakes are recorded. Why? Because this whole book is about Jesus Christ. This book shows that Jesus Christ is the one that's perfect. Jesus Christ is the one who's sinless. Jesus Christ is the only one that can save you. And man has been a consistent failure from the very beginning. So what you do is you get a lot of perverts out there, and they'll go through and they'll look for where the Bible records man's sin, and then they'll use that as doctrine. And they'll ignore the places where God gives direct instructions saying, don't do this, don't do that, stop, don't do that. They ignore those portions of the scripture and they'll look for man's sin and say, see, he did it, so so can I. The ends justify the means. One of the mottos of the Jesuit order. But let's continue. Genesis chapter 11. Next chapter, verse 1 through 9. You have chapter 10 there basically giving what happens for the next hundreds, thousands, maybe even thousands of years going out into the future, how the whole earth was overspread. Now it jumps back to Genesis chapter 11 to immediately what happened after chapter 9 where they're told, you know, okay, you go out and, you know, these unique prophecies for them. Genesis chapter 11, verse 1 and the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain, plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Okay, now who was from who was in, in Shinar there? Genesis chapter 10, verse 10. Okay, Nimrod, the Hamites, in other words. 
Verse 3, And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick, and burn them throughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And by the way, it wasn't just Ham there, Nimrod and things. It was a whole bunch of them. They were all together. You know, family reunion. <laughs> Wanted to build a city with a big tower in it. Isn't it interesting that that still goes on to this very day? They build cities and they build big towers. The taller, the better. And each one brags about how, they're, how tall their tallest building is. And what are cities? Centers for integration. Oh yeah. Not much changes. Verse 8, or excuse me, verse 5. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. What did it say in Genesis chapter 6? Every imagination of their heart was only evil continually. Uh, what does the average city have in it? Every kind of evil that you can imagine. Right? Oh, yeah. Verse 7, Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, or Babel, however you want to say it, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. God would bust up a bunch of people trying to get together? Sounds like he's for segregation, doesn't it? So that's a weak argument. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. There's a lot stronger ones coming. There are things, brethren, by the end of the study, if, you're, if you still are for interracial marriage and in, interracial mingling and stuff like this, then you have some major problems because the Bible is crystal clear. You're going to see it in this study. I'm going to show you a real good one. Turn your Bible next to Deuteronomy chapter 32. Here's a good one for you uh, one-worlders. And that's what this is really all about. I mean, you know, let's all come together. Let's put aside our differences. Why? Why? Can you have a one world government, a one world religion with everybody separate? No, you have to have everybody come together. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 7 through 9. Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. How can you do that if you're integrated? Ask thy father, and he will show thee. Thy elders, and they will tell thee. Family heritage? Yeah, yeah, sure. What are they telling you? You ready? Verse 8. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance. Boy, remember that one. When he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. For the Lord's portion is His people. Jacob is the lot of His inheritance. What a racially bigoted thing to say. I mean, can you imagine the God of heaven actually saying that there's only one kindred of people that is His inheritance? And then he has the nerve, the nerve, the absolute nerve to number the nations and say there are 12 distinct nations and I'm going to put borders between them so that they don't cross those borders. And you know what the devil does? He goes down and he goes and he messes up those borders and says, come on, come on, send them over here, send them over there. You know why? Because he's trying to get God's wrath to come down on this earth and it's going to come. This mess that we have right now in our world is not God's design. It's Satan's design. And God's about fed up with it. Genesis chapter 6, God looks down upon men and he goes, It repents me that I've even made them. Jesus says, As in the days of Noah, so too shall be in the days before the coming of the Son of Man. How do you think God feels about this world right now? This integrated mess. 
Do you think it repents him that he's even made man? Oh no, he looks down at the world and he says, I just love everybody. I love everything. I'm just so happy. Oh, isn't it so wonderful? Look at all these children all coming together and in one, in unity. <laughs> you worship a false god if that's what you believe. Oh yeah. But uh, notice, divided to the nations their inheritance. Inheritance. Remember that. That's going to be important later. But you see, God set boundaries. You say, prove it. He set the bounds of the people. And by the way, check out something else there. Separated the sons of Adam. You see, what the Lord did is, He actually jumped right past Shem, Ham, Japheth, and He went back to Adam. So nobody could say, you know, well, Eve is the mother of all living. We're all, we all come from Adam. No, actually there was... The flood happened and then God chose three sons and gave them each a distinct prophecy and said, you go that way, you go this way, you go that way. But you see, God even jumped over that and said, they're all sons of Adam, that's true, but I've separated them into 12 boundaries. And I want to show you the very extreme significance of that number 12. And uh, what is 12 divisible by? Three. Three sons. Three times four is 12. Well, that's going to be very important. But let's go to Acts chapter 17, one of the big disputed passages. Acts 17, 26 does not teach, you know, separation. It does not teach that interracial marriage is wrong. Well, then you're blind. Acts chapter 17, verse 26. And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. And I've talked about this so many times. The way you can always check a false prophet, they will stop right there. They will never keep reading. They'll stop the quotation right there. Boom, they stop it. We're all of one blood. Now, is that true? Sure, absolutely. You take a, a guy from China, right in the, the midst of the heart of China, you go in, you cut him, red blood comes out. You go to Africa, deepest, darkest part of the jungle, you cut a guy, red blood comes out. You go to the northern part of, of Scandinavia or something like that, cutting red blood comes out. We're all of one blood, that's true. Then we're all the same. Uh, no, that's not what the Bible teaches. And when you stay in the bounds that God has created, and when you celebrate those boundaries and say, hey, I'm different, I have distinct things, there's a gift that comes to that. God divided the lands and He gives those different nations inheritance. We're going to see that. Continue reading here in verse 26. And hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. And by the way, what we read back there in Deuteronomy, that stuff is still binding on us today. Oh yeah. It absolutely is. And it ties right in with this verse. Deuteronomy said, bounds of the people. This says, bounds of their habitation. You say, what's the significance? Look at verse 27, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. You know what happens when you deal with people of your own kindred? You have a lot of similarities, a lot of things in common. You start to deal with people from all these other countries and all these other kindreds and everything else. You don't have much in common with them. So you're too busy worrying about, well, I disagree with you on this, and I disagree with you on that, and things, and I don't really understand where you're coming from. I mean, you know, oh, we're all the same. We're all the same. Oh, yeah, come on, people. I mean, take some guy from Africa. Take a, an Italian, you know, with all the action and everything else with their hands. Take some guy from Japan that's stoic and, and you know, oh, yes, I'm quite honored to meet you. Take, take those three guys and stick them in a room someplace and, then, and, and watch their conversation and tell me that we're all the same. I mean, even in America, you get somebody from up in New England. I mean, fortunately, up where we're at, people talk normal. But you go, you know, down into the, like the Boston region, you know, you got the, the Doya and, the, and Harvard and all this stuff like that. They talk with that type of an accent, you know. And then you get some guy from down south and he's going like, you know, hey, what are you doing over there, you know, and all that. 
and you get some guy from out in the Midwest and they have their own accent. And you get some guy from Pennsylvania like this weirdo and they got their own accent and stuff like this. There, I've met people, I have, I have family that lives in West Virginia. They you know, have a farm down there. I've met people when I'm down there visiting them, I don't understand what they're saying. <laughs> You know, I mean, there was a, a guy, I've probably told this story before, but uh, we were down there, my brother-in-law and I had gone down, we were with this guy named Gary, a friend of my sister and her husband, and uh, he took us fishing. And so we met at his, his apartment and uh, he made us breakfast, really good cook, amazing cook, you know, really good breakfast. And we go outside and there's this older woman sitting out on the front porch of this apartment building that he was living in. And he goes, oh, hi, Mrs. You know, so-and-so. And she's like, and he's like, yeah, I saw that. The price is really going up on the potatoes at the store. And we're like, huh? You know? And she's like, and we're like, and, and he's looking at us and he's like, oh, you know, they, yeah, they're, they're from Pennsylvania, you know? And it's like, <laughs> we didn't understand a word she was saying. Why? We're separate. You see? God creates people to be separate. We go different directions and things change. We have different personalities and praise the Lord for them. Again, I'm not putting anybody down. I'm not saying that they're dumb down south or something. There's a lot of southerners that have a lot more brains than people up north. Okay. They can farm. They can do a lot of things down south. I've seen it, you know, and then there's some people that are really dumb down south too. And there's some dumb people up north and they're smart people up north. See, I'm not prejudiced against anybody. And these nonsense fools out there they are trying to say that I am are liars. But you see there, when you get people all in the same area, in the bounds of their habitation, you do things alike, you think alike, you act alike. Again, you know, uh, my wife and I, she's German descent, I'm German descent. A lot of things that she went through in her past, I've gone through many of those same, similar things. She has some differences, I have some differences, but we think alike. You know, again, when I, when I was looking to get married, uh, you know, I really didn't know what to, to look for and things. And, and I'm going to tell you a little uh, secret here. And a lot of you are going to go, huh? Um, I've only ever dated seriously three women in my life. There was other women and stuff like that, but it never got anywhere serious or anything. But I've only ever dated uh, seriously three women. The first two were Spanish. One from Central America, one from Costa Rica, one from Honduras. He said, oh, you hypocrite. Listen to me. When I had, uh, when I was dating them and there was never any fornication or anything, so don't go there. But you know, the, the point is when I was dating them, uh, I confused lust for love. All right. And that's what it was. I didn't really love them. I had no real, uh, thing in, in common with them. And you know, and I, I could feel it even as a lost man back when I was dating them, I was lost. I couldn't have turned to any kind of integration or segregation stuff in the Bible to save my life. I was lusting after them. And it's interesting because, you know, it's like I was interested in them, but yet there was just something there. It was a disconnect there going, I just don't see eye to eye with them on certain issues. I just, I don't understand. I, I had no idea why I felt this way. Again, I couldn't, have, I didn't even, I wasn't even saved. I didn't know what the King James Bible even said. But it was just something in me going, this culture is just, there's something different there. Now let's just, just assume that I had fought my way through that whole thing and just, oh, I'm, I'm going to marry them anyhow and stuff. And I'd have married a, a woman from Central America. Do you think she'd want to live here in Northern Maine? No. But I married my wife, who's of German descent herself. She loves snow just as much as I do. She loves cold temperatures. And ironically, this area, uh, Roosduke County, is actually climate wise almost identical to Germany. You know, the southern part of Germany. It's cold there, it's cold here. I mean, very, very, very similar. You know, it's interesting. We get along very, very well. Our minds think alike. But my mind never thought alike with the women, those Spanish girls that I knew in my past. And I thank the Lord that I didn't fall for that and become into an integrated situation. I thank the Lord that the Lord spared me from that and that I married the right kind of a wife. You know, and again, you know, oh, well, you shouldn't have uh, brought up, your wife shouldn't have said anything about the, the thing of uh, 
make sure that you're of the same kindred when it comes to bearing children. Well, the whole purpose of the thing of free birthing is you want to do as many things right as you can so that there won't be those complications there when the child is born. And again, I know of a situation, like I've said in other things, I know of a situation where a Japanese and a Hamite had a child and they told her in the hospital, this Japanese woman, the child's just too big. It can't come out normally. Why? The genes don't work out. Oh, but I know of a situation. Oh, I'm sure you do. The exception to the rule overthrows the rule, right? That's not how it works. I mean, common sense should pre prevail somewhere here, you know? But, uh, you know, I, I just, I wish people could understand this thing, that the Bible very clearly, back in the Old Testament, says God set bounds of the people. Here it says the bounds of their habitation. Why? So that there's common ground there. So that you're both thinking alike. I mean, you know, again, I'll just tell you another little example here. Uh, when, as a woodworker, there are certain woods that are similar that'll work well together. There are other woods that are completely at opposite ends of the spectrum and you try blending them together to do certain things, it doesn't work. God creates things to be diverse. You know, and another point I want to make here very quickly, another thing I need to answer is this thing people say, I've seen in the comments, people go, uh, yes, well, purebred dogs are actually weaker than, than mutt dogs. They're, mutt dogs are healthier. Again, that is a total, complete fabrication. That is a lie. All right, you get a purebred dog that's been bred for a certain thing, like you get an Irish wolfhound. They're the biggest dogs, you know, in the world, I believe. And uh, they're huge, you know, just gigantic. I mean, the things are like, you know, their backs are like this high or something. I mean, they're, they're gigantic dogs. And they were bred to be very, very big. Well, they have problems because of that. They've gotten too far away from the original type of a canine uh, type of dog. Uh, if you want to see a pure canine, Look at a fox or a wolf or a coyote. That's a pure wild canine. And you have dogs that are very similar to that, like the German Shepherd, uh, Golden Retrievers, Husky dogs. You know, I'm not, you know, not the name for that, you know, but a, a, a Husky dog. They are, you know, very close to what a wolf or a coyote looks like. And they're not going to have problems. You want seeing eye dogs, you get a German Shepherd. You want a police dog that can sniff out drugs or bombs or whatever, you get a German Shepherd. Um, again, I'll tell you a little story. Uh, we had a German Shepherd growing up. Her name was Sally. And uh, she was, I don't know how pure she was or whatever else. You know, we bought her from an Amish breeder and there's plenty of problems there. But uh, Sally was an incredibly intelligent dog. She could find a way to, we had a chain hooked to her house, uh, like a dog chain, you know. And it had the little hasp thing on it that you, you know, you pull it, push the little lever up and then you click it on to the collar and then it, it, it locks. She figured a way out to get that thing undone. And she went out and she was running around town and actually had puppies from another dog and messed up her <laughs> kindred purity. But uh, that's the way dogs are. They don't have the brains to not do that. But, uh, you know, Sally, at one point in time, I remember we was, it was a summertime and uh, we're sitting there eating supper and she was out in the backyard. She was just loose. We lived in the woods, you know, so she'd be on our property there. But I remember this one time we're sitting there eating and we see the door knob. We hear the door knob. And all of a sudden she goes, she has her paws like this on the outside standing up and she opens the door to the side of the house, pushes the door open, drops down and walks into the kitchen. She was a smart dog. We had other mutt dogs. They couldn't figure that thing out to, to save their lives. You know, what am I saying? She was pure, at least before she went out and did her thing there. And, you know, so this argument that a purebred is somehow inferior or something like that, that is, that is a total lie. Unless you're talking about a pure, quote unquote, genetically modified dog, like a teacup poodle or a Irish, you know, wolfhound, one of these types of dogs like that, yeah, they do have problems because they're so, you know, bred for certain traits for so many years, for sometimes, you know, centuries to get to where they're at. And yeah, they will have problems. They'll have bone problems and stuff because they're too big, you know, so, or too small. <laughs> but my point is this, this whole thing of, you know, just science teaching that when you breed things of similar 
descent, you're going to have good offspring. I mean, that's science. Again, do you think that the people that are trying to breed racehorses, do you think that they go out and they say, well, we'll just get kind of any old, you know, uh, draft horse over here and a miniature pony over there and we'll come out with a racehorse? Of course not. But yet when you suggest it for people where you say, you know, you ought to marry somebody of your own kindred, somebody that's within the bounds of your habitation. And there are certain boundaries too within America, by the way. There are certain areas where kindreds separate themselves. You get a bunch of black people down south, like Georgia or something like that, they don't want to live around white people. And again, I've seen that. I've been different places and stuff. I remember as a, as a boy, I tell you this story too. In Washington, D.C., the one time we, we went down and my dad got, ended up getting lost. We went down to see the thing as a family, as a vacation. And he ended up taking a bunch of wrong turns. And he got over into the bad part of the town, or I should say the black part of the town. I guess it's not bad if you're black, but it was for us. And this, there were these black kids out running up over the cars, playing on the cars and stuff. And they said, look, whiteies, when they saw us going by. They're yelling, hey, look at the whiteies, look at the whiteies. You know, they didn't want us there. They weren't saying, oh, come on, move in. We got a nice place next door here. Why don't you move in? They were saying, hey, get out of our neighborhood. You know what? There's nothing wrong with that. Why? They don't want us there. They have bounds of their habitation. Again, why am I going to go and take my culture into their neighborhood. Why? Oh, because we all have to be one. We're going to see where that philosophy comes from. It doesn't come from God. But let's continue. Enough of my little stories for now. Now, Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7. I mean, I think by now you should be able to see that God definitely has set bounds you can't escape that. Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7. It says here, Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Okay, I just wanted to cover that again, because again, I, I've heard people say, well, the day there, that day is great. It's talking about the day of the Lord. No, I don't believe that. I believe in context what it's talking about there is that day. Like, I remember back in the old days, you know, Excuse me, talking about a time period. I don't believe that that's a specific reference to the day of the Lord, the thousand-year millennial kingdom. I believe it's talking about the time of Jacob's trouble there, the uh, Daniel 70th week, falsely called the Great Tribulation. Verse 8, For it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off thy neck, and will burst thy bonds, and strangers shall no more serve themselves of him. But they shall serve the Lord their God, and David their king, whom I will raise up unto them. Therefore fear thou not, O my servant Jacob, saith the Lord, neither be, thou, neither be dismayed, O Israel, for lo, I will save thee from afar, and thy seed from the land of their captivity. And Jacob shall return, and shall be in rest, and be quiet, and none shall make him afraid. For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee, though I make a full end of all nations, whither I have scattered thee, yet will I not make a full end of thee, but I will correct thee in measure and will not leave thee altogether unpunished. That's the point of this whole passage right here. All right, God has plans for the nation of Israel. That's why the devil is trying so hard to get in there and blend everybody together. Get rid of the distinctions. You see what's going on here? Integration is part of Satan's plan. That's what's going on. But God says here in the passage that he's going to make a full end of all the nations. Well, see, God just wants everybody to come together, right? No. Let's keep looking in the scriptures here to see what is really going on. Zechariah chapter 14. Turn towards the New Testament, one of the minor prophets. Zechariah 14, verse 16 through 21. The Lord's going to just whip the different heathen nations out there and just wreck them in that time of Jacob's trouble. And you say, then he's done with them. Not so. Jeremiah chapter 14, verse 16 through 21. And it shall come to pass that every one that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of tabernacles. There will be some people that survive. And God has that plan for a reason. 
We're going to see why. And it shall be so that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. And if the family of Egypt go not up and come not that have no rain, there shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the feast of tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the feast of tabernacles. And that day shall there be upon the bells of the horses holiness unto the Lord, and the pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Yea, every pot in Jerusalem and in Judah shall be holiness unto the Lord, and all they that sacrifice shall come and take of them and see therein. And in that day there shall no more be the Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. The Lord's doing. He's going to exclude the Canaanite from his house. He said, well, I just take it up with the Lord. I didn't write it. You got a problem with it? Then you take it up with the author. I'm not the author of the book. All right? But you see there, in the time of Jacob's trouble, God goes, bam, and wipes out the nations. But not totally. God restores the nations in the millennial kingdom. Hmm. Interesting. Revelation chapter 5. Does God see distinction? Yes, he does. And so will we. Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. It says here, And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. That's Christians. And it's talking in context, it's talking about the 24 elders. And there's a lot of surmising who the 24 elders are, and most people are just as far away from it as, uh, you know, ice balls and snowballs are from hell. You know, <laughs> people are so far away from it. You say, well, what do you mean? Well, the 24 elders are the 12 apostles and 12 men from the Old Testament. Absolute total nonsense. How do you know? Verse 9. Redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. They're not Jews. I'll grant you there's Jews involved, but they're not all Jews. And I'm going to give you my theory. I've been, I've been going over this thing. I wonder who the 24 elders are. People have asked me, who are the 24 elders? I'm going, I really don't know. I'm going to give you a theory about it. Revelation chapter 7, verse 4. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed an hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Again, I brought this up in other videos. In this time, God makes a distinction. The time of Jacob's trouble, God makes a distinction between the Jews and the Gentiles. Jump down to verse 9. After this I beheld and lo a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Notice this is John seeing this. This is not John being told this. John is looking and he is seeing kindred distinction. He's looking and saying there's, there's a man, there's an African, there's Japanese, that guy's Chinese, there's Korean, there's a, there's a um, German there, there's a He's looking and he's seeing the distinctions. John sees it. Now go to John, or Revelation chapter 20, verses 7 through 10. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Hmm. So Satan actually, when he's loosed at the end of the millennial kingdom, he goes out and he deceives the nations to come, to come against the Jews, one last time, the nation of Israel, Jerusalem, the beloved city, the city of the great king. He does it one more time. So uh, 
Who is it that's for integration? The devil? You show me one place in this King James Bible where God tells everybody to get together and eliminates the distinctions. He doesn't do it. It's the devil that does it. So you get these people coming out, integration, 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 don't be a racist. Uh. You know what you're dealing with? You're dealing with a servant of hell, a minister of Satan. And you know, you have somebody come out and say, the white race is superior to the master race and the Jews are synagogue of Satan and we should hate the Jews and things and put them down and whatever else, never support what's going on. You're dealing with the minister of Satan as well. You see? What's the true stand of a Bible believer? A Bible believer says, okay, I understand what the King James Bible teaches, and it says God set the bounds of their habitation. So I'm going to love my brothers and sisters in Christ, no matter what their kindred is, but I'm not going to join myself with them in marriage. You say, well, but but we have, we, we are different mixed kindred. Well, we're going to get to, to that in the study. And again, I'm just quoting Scripture. You're going to have to figure out what to do about some of this stuff between you and the Lord. Revelation chapter 21, verses 23 through 27. And you can go down through here, by the way, too. Revelation 21, and you'll see this thing of 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, over and over again. But let's look at verse 23. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Nations. Wait a second. I thought God ended the nations in the time of Jacob's trouble. He did. But he restored them in the millennial kingdom. You say, well, wait a second. I thought the devil went out and gathered nations together to go against the Jews that one last time, and God ended it again. Yeah, but he brought the nations back again. Huh? Every time the devil tries to blend all the nations together, God goes, bam, and separates them again. It makes distinction. You think maybe the Lord has a Feeling about integration? Do you think maybe the Lord doesn't want everybody to come together? Oh, just maybe. Even after he's gone boom and destroying man, he goes and he builds it back up again. With distinction. 